So the question is, how do we actually calculate this marginal probability? First of all, the event E, testing positive, actually consists of two well, elementary events in this case. E1, which is we test positive and the person has the virus, and E2, the test is positive and the person doesn't have the virus. So by probability law 4, we know that the probability of E1 is the probability of testing positive, given the person has the virus, times the probability the person has the virus. And similarly, the probability of E2 is the probability that the person tests positive if they don't have the virus, times the probability they don't have the virus. Now, E1 and E2 are mutually exclusive. So we know from probability law 2 that the probability of E1 or E2 is just the probability of E1 plus E2. So that's, that's the probability law 2. But of course, because we know this, that gives us, that's P1. And of course, because we know this, we know that this is that. But we also know that E is equal to E1 or E2. So because those are equal, we can conclude that the probability of E is that formula there. Okay. So now we can actually plug the values in. Well, we, we, were, we, know, what that, we know what that is. Probability of E given H1 is 0.99. We know that that is 0.001. We know that that is 0.095. Well, what's P of H2? Well, we know that P of H2 must be equal to 1 minus P of H1 because those are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. So that's going to be equal to 0.999. And that's what we've done here. And when we plug that in, we end up with 0.05094. And in general, if H has got more than two states, so if, if the states of H where H1 has the virus, H2 has a different virus, H3, no virus, then the marginal probability of E is just extended. And of course, that formula extends to N states. So it would be the probability of E given H1 times probability of H1 plus all the way up to the probability of E given Hn times the probability of Hn. But what we really want to know is that if in our virus example you have a screening test and you get a positive test result, what's the probability you actually have the virus? So what we're asking for here is to compute the probability of H1, the probability we have the virus, given that we've had a positive test result. And this is called the posterior probability of H1 because it's the revised probability after getting the evidence E, positive test result. Now the problem is that we've not been given this probability, although we do know the prior probability, that's of H1, which is 0.001, that's the population probability, the probability that a randomly selected person the population has the virus. What Bayes' theorem provides is a formula for calculating the posterior probability in terms of the prior probability, as well as other probabilities that we do know, like the probability of a positive test result given the person has a virus, and, as we've just seen, the marginal probability of the evidence. So how do we derive Bayes' theorem? Well, we, as I said, you just use probability law 4. Now what we can do is we can rearrange that to come up with that formula. So all we're doing is we're just multiplying both sides here by a probability of A, and we get that formula there. Now, probability law 4 doesn't distinguish between A and B. So it's also the case that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And we can divide the same thing again and come up with that formula. And what we can see here is that the right-hand side in both cases is the same. And that means that this, these two things are equal. So let's just bring them down, and they're equal. And what we're going to do now is simply, so we've just divided both sides by probability of B, and hey presto, that is Bayes' theorem. The probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. That is Bayes' theorem, and there's its proof. And we can now combine Bayes' theorem and the marginal probabilities to answer the question of interest for the virus example.
So you've had a screening test and you get a positive test result. What's the probability that you have the virus? So we're asking here, as I said, to compute the probability of H1 given E, the posterior probability of H1. And by Bayes' theorem, we know that that's equal to that formula, the probability of E given H1 times the probability of H1 over the probability of E. But we already know that the probability of E given H1 is that. We know the probability of H1 is that. And we already computed the marginal probability P of E to be that. And so we just plug them into the formula and we get that result, which incidentally is less than 2%. So despite the positive test result, given these the false positive and false negative probabilities and the prior, there's less than a 2% chance that you have the virus. Now, kind of like an aside here, all probabilities are conditional. The probability of every event is actually conditioned on some background knowledge or context. So if A is the event, roll a four on a die, then the probability of A is a six if the background information is that the die is generally fair and there can be no outcome other than one, two, three, four, five, six. We might also say that the probability of A given K is a six if the assumption for the background is that there's no outcome other than one, two, three, four, five, six. And I have no reason to suspect that any one is more likely than ever any other. It's slightly different. But the probability of A given K might be an eighth if K is the assumption that the only outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, six, lost and lands on edge, and all of those are equally likely. Or it might be a tenth if K is the assumption that the results of an experiment in which we roll the die 200 times and observe the outcome four 20 times is representative of the frequency of four that would be obtained in any number of rolls of the die. And that brings us on to the subject, which I kind of said right at the beginning, which was how do we actually get to particular probabilities? We've got the framework of working out combining probabilities, working out conditional probabilities, base, etc. But somehow we've got to be able to get some probabilities in there. And the only ones that I've really told you about that we can kind of reasonably assume are where we've got n elementary events and they're all equally likely and in that case the probability is 1 over m for each of those and then we can use that to build up more probability of more complex events but it turns out there's a different approach the frequentist and subjective approach to probability with the frequentist approach the assumption here is that the event that we want to get the probability of can be observed multiple times in repeated experiments like dozen and coin course so we record how many times in the long run the event occurs so if we continually toss a coin and record the proportion of heads, then it might converge. If it converges on 50%, then we deduce that there's a probability of 0.5 of tossing a head. So that's where we get our 0.5. But it's a notice that actually if we'd only tossed it, let's say, 90 times, the cutoff point would have been here, then actually it looks like it's converging on a number which is above 50%. So we'd have actually had to conclude that the probability of tossing a head was about 51% or something like that. So there's a warning here that even the frequentist approach doesn't give you the kind of objectivity that people normally think of. There's always subjectivity in where you cut off the experiment, essentially. Now, in contrast with the subjective approach, we accept that we can't possibly repeat experiments to observe whether the event occurs. So we have to use judgment based on either limited observations of the event or similar events. So we might decide there's incredibly low 0.000001% chance of aliens landing on Earth this year. Now, we've never observed an event like that, but it kind of like seems wrong to completely rule it out. The question is, are these actually that different? You know, it turns out actually when you get into the details of things, these things kind of like converge. So a classic frequentist probability would be the probability of a baby born in the UK as a girl. So I believe at the moment that's based on masses of recent birth data. There's a slightly less than 51% chance that a baby born in the UK is a girl. But actually this changes over time. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a greater chance of a baby born in the UK being a boy. So again, there's no definite answer here. It depends on what data you're using over which period and if we slightly change this to say what's the chance that the particular mother who is pregnant next week 
What's that probability? Well, if we know nothing about that mother, then we might use this current frequentist probability based on recent data. But, you know, we might have much more information about that particular mother and come up with a different probability. Now look at something like this. There's a 40% chance a team from Europe will win the next World Cup. Well, that would normally be considered classic subjective judgment. But again, well, we've got a little bit of data on this. We've seen a number of World Cups. We, we've seen the number of times that Europeans have won it. So we can use some frequentist data there. We can also use expert judgment about how good the European teams are compared with the non-European teams. There's also data on how much more likely European teams are to win the World Cup if the tournament's held in Europe or not. So we'll use information about where the next World Cup is held to inform our subjective probability there. Whichever way you look at it, some subjectivity is inevitable. And that's why Bayes, which is based on subjective conditional probabilities, is kind of inevitable in any risk assessment. It's also important to note that all probabilities are personal in the sense that they're conditioned on personal knowledge and beliefs. So that's why if we go back to the O.J. Simpson example, O.J. Simpson will have a very different probability that O.J. Simpson murdered his ex-wife than let's say you will have, or a member of the jury would have had, having seen the evidence. Well, just look at another example. Just suppose a reliable friend rolls a die, but we cannot see what number comes up. The friend tells me, but not you, that the number was even. Then my probability that a number rolled was six is equal to a third. But your probability that a number rolled was a six is equal to a six. And they're both rational and correct probabilities given the information available.